Okay, I'm going to introduce uh, Dave Purley. He's the director of the Mi'kmaq Wollastook Center and one of the um, one of the committee members for and responsible for the Peace and Friendship Treaty Days here at the University of New Brunswick. So, uh, Dave, we can introduce our first guest speaker. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, Al, Lynn, George, Willie, well, and Chris. Thank you, Chris and George, for doing the opening ceremony. I think it's important uh, when you look at the records and look at the negotiations for the peace and friendship treaties. Um, my ancestors always had a ceremony. They had to be in the right frame of mind to be able to discuss very difficult topics at the time. So, one way of doing that was to conduct the ceremony. And and what Chris and George have have done today is puts us in the right frame of mind. You know, we have to we have to release that. If we have any negative energy, we have to release that. We have to find ways to release that negative energy and invite uh, positive energy into, into this gathering. Uh, smudging, or uh, what we, we call it smudging, but basically it's cleansing of the mind, the body, and the spirit. Another, another uh, method of cleansing the mind and body and spirit, of course, is the sweat lodge. And that's why this, uh, this event uh, promotes and emphasizes the need to have a a, a cultural component to the program, and I hope that you'll, uh, if you're interested, this, this, the sweat lodge isn't just for First Nations people, it's also for non-natives who are interested, who want to experience cleansing of the mind, the body, and spirit, so I, I encourage you to sign up as well. Um, I want to thank you for coming to Wolastigwe territory. UNB is located on traditional Wolastigwe territory. It's unpurchased. It's on uh, unceded territory, and, uh, and 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 UNB has already acknowledged that that we are on traditional Wolastigwe territory. So I welcome all of you to our territory. Our first speaker for today, of course, is uh, I have the honor of uh, introducing our first speaker for today. And that would be uh, Stephen Augustine from Elsie Booktook or Big Hole First Nation. Um, until January t 2013, Stephen Augustine was the curator of ethnology for Eastern Maritimes in the Ethnology Service Division of the Canadian Museum of Civilization since 1996 in Gatineau, Ottawa for 16 years. He holds a master's degree in Canadian studies from Carleton University focusing on traditional knowledge curriculum development in the context of the education system. He obtained a BA in anthropology and political science from St. Thomas University in 1986. Over the years, Mr. Augustine has shared his expertise in research and traditional knowledge with many organizations, including government departments, the Assembly of First Nations, and various Aboriginal communities across Canada. He is a part of an advisory panel on biodiversity issues and has worked extensively with the United Nations Program on Development and the Environment. He has been teaching for eight years a sessional course at Carleton University um, um, titled Aboriginal Peoples and the Knowledge Economy. He has been invited as guest speaker at national and international conferences. He has published papers, been, rec been recorded for radio programs and various uh, video programs on traditional knowledge, maritimes, maritime history, and treaties and storytelling. He has organized cross-cultural workshops and made presentations to a wide variety of institutions, UN, federal, and provincial departments, universities, museums, UNESCO, and the Vatican. His book on the C CMC collection, Mi'kmaq and Maliseet Cultural Ancestral Material, Mercury Series, CMC 2005, has proven to a valuable resource for academic researchers and educators alike. Over the last few years, he has been accredited as an expert witness in various court cases involving Aboriginal access to resources in the Maritimes, being recognized for his knowledge both of oral history and ethno history and of the treaties in the region. He has recently been 
named the recipient of the 2009 National Aboriginal Achievement Award for Culture, Heritage, and Spirituality, and the 2009 New Brunswick Lieutenant Governor's Dialogue Award. He has also been named um, in fall of 2008 member of the Sectorial Commission for Culture, Communication, and Information for the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. He has been elder advisor to the Federal Court of Canada judges, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and the Human Rights Commission of Canada. In his role as a hereditary chief in the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, and by elders training since an early age, Stephen Augustine has a thorough command of traditional practices, his language, and history of his people. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Stephen Augustine. I bet you were expecting an old, old man to stand up here. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just want to give you a a little uh, background information about uh, why they had to change the sweat lodge ceremony. Bob Ray broke the sauna last night at the hotel, <laughs> and he stormed out of here this morning in the, in, in the rain. <laughs> anyway, I, I thought I'd start off with a, on a good note. <laughs> uh, well, all you can tell you, you can tell me that you can tell me that you can tell me that you can tell me George P.L. Paul. me that you can tell me that you can tell me that you can Dave, Dave Purley and I, and uh, we were instrumental in starting the Native Studies program in, in this university, uh, UNB and St. Thomas, mostly St. Thomas. But we had the history department and the anthropology department and the political science department. They had one course each on Aboriginal or Native Studies. And out of that one course, maybe uh, in, in a three-hour lecture, uh, half an hour was devoted to Mi'kmaq studies or Mount Ulustukwiuk studies. And uh, so it's, it's come a long ways. And uh, I'm happy to, uh, <laughs> I almost, my voice almost broke. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to reconnect with, with David, David Purley. And um, we go back uh, a long ways. Uh, and. Uh, in the field of education, I mean, I would like to say that he, he's been leading the way and I've been just following and kind of out of circumstance end up in, 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 in the situation where I'm in right now, the position that I hold as Dean of Unamagi College. Anyway, I was supposed to have a PowerPoint presentation here, but everything seems to have, uh, Trenton, can you come up here? and? Help me again. Oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, I'm always jealous of PowerPoints because I have to compete with the, all the images, and this is the guy that you have to listen to. And so I, I kind of uh, brought together. Uh, it's not a PowerPoint, really. It's it's uh, actually a, a Word document that I didn't get a chance to switch over to a PowerPoint. Um, but it's a presentation I made back in 2011. And the other, the other article that I have in my hand is Negotiating for Life and Survival, which was a contribution to a chapter being prepared by uh, Marie Batiste and Sagage Henderson at University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. It's, it's, supposed to be up, it's supposed to be published already, but you know how the publication process uh, uh, flows along slowly. So anyway, what I want to talk about is 
reconciliation and, and the peace and friendship treaties. And to say that there is a continuous relationship from the original way of how indigenous peoples in North America engaged uh, uh, the uh, newcomers or the strangers on the land here in, in North America and us in the eastern seaboard uh, engaged a uh, very long, long time ago. The beginning part, you can see here, if I can scroll down a little. Um, in 1610, when member two was baptized, this is a representation on a wampum belt, a wampum belt which is much longer, but what I wanted to point out on the center part of the wampum belt is, is the Grand Chief. We don't know who the Grand Chief is, but we're assuming it's member two, who accepted the church by holding on to the cross, and he's got his medicine bundle, or traditional bundle, or sacred bundle, uh, with his sacred pipe, and all the things that are uh, needed in that. And, and on the other side is, is the black robe, or the it wasn't the, the Jesuits, it's the, I, I believe it's the Jesuits that made the wampum belt to use to help convert Indians as they traveled in to, the, to the interior to the Atikamekw, uh, Montagnier, or Inu territory, the uh, Anishinaabeg territory, the Algonquins and Ojibwe, and, and this is the belt that they used to convince them that the church is the best way to go. And uh, I would just go a little bit further and say this is really the way First Nations people treated one another. In a peaceful relationship, they recorded their agreements on wampum belts. Um, and and, and what, what is kind of a interesting phenomena about the peace and friendship treaty process among First Nations in, in North America was the way to keep peace was to give the young girls to your neighboring tribe. 10, 11, nine-year-old girls would be given over to your neighboring tribe. And Abby Maillard, Pierre Maillard, records that the Mi'kmaq gave some of their Mi'kmaq children to the Wulustukwiuk people on the St. John River. And, and some kind of a misunderstanding took place and there was a little bit of a skirmish, but it wasn't an all-out war of one nation trying to wipe out the other nation. It was just family members kind of getting even with somebody uh, doing something to somebody else. And, and, and that is pretty well the nature of, of uh, indigenous or First Nations conflicts in North America. There was skirmishes between the Mi'kmaq and the Mohawks, but they were just skirmishes in Listuguch and, and the Laurentian, so-called Laurentian Mohawks that used to live and travel all the way up the Gaspé coast and even, uh, it has been said that they have even gone all the way to Chapel Island in, in, in Cape Britain Island. Uh, and this is uh, by oral, oral tradition, oral history. Um, so the First Nations entered into those agreements and, and they gave their young girls so that it was a protection process. We're not going to attack you because our, da our daughters are in your village. This is the way we uh, kept peace with one another. And that relationship was, was embodied by <clears throat> uh, sharing the pipe smudging a prayer, lighting the pipe, going into the sweat lodge ceremony. There were descriptions of these activities that were, were done in the early 1600s all the way up. In eastern New England, in the Cask Casco Basin or Casco Bay, in su southern part of Maine, it was part of New England at the time before it was all divided up into New Hampshire, Vermont, and Connecticut, and Massachusetts, and so on. Uh, they did a, a treaty ceremony in, in, in Casco Bay. It is said as early as 
1658. But the only recorded ones that were uh, uncovered were 1676, 1678, 1680, 1690, 1692, 1702, and the most notable one was 1713. But the interesting aspect about that first negotiation of the first treaty, the British and the Indians, they stood up two stones, two pillars of stones that they called two brothers. One was the English brother, and the other one was the indigenous brother. All the Wabanaki nations gathered together and entered into this treaty relationship with, with the Europeans or the, the British or the English at the time. They were not uni unified into a Great Britain yet. I mean, they were specifically just English peoples that arrived here in North America and settled in New England. And the, and the understanding of the first treaty was the English wanted to come ashore to put their boats. They wanted to build wharves, and they wanted to store some of their fishing equipment and maybe have some habitation that is surrounded by a fence to keep the savage people out and, and keep the English people inside. And that was the, the understanding of the first agreement to say, can we come ashore and dry our fish and, and dock our, our ships? And, and actually, that treaty relationship is, I would say, and, and, and according to John Ralston's soul, his book on Canada, a fair country, we are all treaty people. The English people signed a treaty, and they are the ones that have a treaty right to our land, not us. We have an aboriginal right to our territory. We never surrendered it. We never gave it up. It was just a peace and friendship treaties in eastern Canada. And these are not the numbered treaties that were done and, and uh, uh, negotiated after Canada formed as a government after 1867. Those numbered treaties were entered into from 1 to 10, and some adhesions were made afterwards. Um, so the, the, the beginning process of, of this uh, treaty relationship was each time we get together, we bring out the pipe because we invite the seven sacred directions, Gizuk, or the giver of life, grandfather, son, the spirit of the grandfather, son, the spirit of the mother earth, the spirit of our leaders, Kaluska, Kaluskavi, our leader, he, he's the example of, uh, of a life that he demonstrates for all of us to follow. This is the way to go because he relies on the wisdom and knowledge of the elders, the grandmothers. They're the knowledge keepers. And they raise the young children, young men, to become future leaders. So they're the knowledge keepers, the wisdom and knowledge of the grandmothers. And then he also relies on the young people. The young people, they are gifted with two eyes. And in our creation story, we're always reminded, watch out for those young kids that are playing around. They look at you. They love you. And they emulate everything that you do. So if you do something bad, like smoking up or drinking or hitting your wife, that young child is going to do the same thing. So the elders keep telling us, you have to live your life in a very good way so that you leave a legacy of survival for those younger generations so they can move forward and, and, and bring this legacy, your legacy, forward into the next seven generations. And also, Gluskab and Gluskavi relied on our mothers because the mothers help the giver of life to give life. They brought children into the world. They raised them in their, they protected them in their body, and then they raised them, and they raised them to, to and weaned them to rely on Mother Earth for, from the birds, plants, animals, and fish so we can obtain our, our food, our medicine, our shelter, our clothing, how we travel about, how we use our tools of survival. Notice I said tools of survival, not weapons. Tools of survival to, to continue life 
And, and those are important elements from coming to us from Mother Earth. And all of our ceremonies that we do, the singing, the dancing, the drumming, the gojua, have a gojua can day, George would say. Um, and and, and those, those dances are us telling Mother Earth, we are your children. Understand us. Listen to our footsteps. We're repeating your, your heartbeat. The drums are, are repeating the heartbeat of our mothers, the earth, who we rely on for our future. So it's important uh, for us to, to understand those messages and our leaders are, are carrying those messages. And that's the responsibility of our traditional leaders, the hereditary chiefs and so on. I'm just going to scroll down here a little bit. Um, I made this presentation to a group of uh, elected chiefs and uh, grand council in Halifax in oh, well, four years ago, five years ago now. And uh, I was making a connection, but I jumped ahead a little bit here too fast. I'm just going to step back a little bit on those on those treaty negotiations and the two pillars of stone and going back to Casco Bay where, where those initial negotiations were taking place. The Mi'kmaq and the Eastern tribal groups were there, but the Mi'kmaq people didn't sign anything. They were also represented by the Wulustukwiuk and the Penobscot and the Abenaki people. They were so intermarriage, so many intermarriages with each other. And this is where that peaceful relationship come into play. We have my great-great-grandmother, her name was Madeleine Paul, and she was a Maliseet from, from uh, the St. John River Valley. I, I can't say St. Mary's, but that's where most of the Pauls are living, and, and up in uh, Dobik or Nigutkuk. And, and so it is important to, to understand that, that these intermarriages our peaceful relationships. We have the Brookses that, that, that were Mi'kmaq from Nova Scotia that ended up in uh, now living in, in St. Mary's. But we also have Brookses living down in Shubenacadie. They're relatives from way, way back. These are our peaceful alliances between different uh, Wabanaki uh, confederacy groups of people, the Mi'kmaq included. So, they were all there witnessing this peaceful ceremony taking place after uh, bringing the pipe to celebrate the seven sacred directions, inviting those seven sacred directions to come down and, and like George said, to look after our deliberations, our conference, our words that we share with one another. Because at the end, when the pipe ceremony is going to be done, the pipe carrier, on behalf of everybody, is going to blow the smoke, representing all the collective words that have been agreed upon and we speak with one voice and our heart is one, one heart of all of us through the, through the pipe and through the smoke. Here we, we entrust our words, our promises to the giver of life, grandfather, son, mother earth, Gluskap, Nugumi, Nedawansam, and Niganaganim Kuzizk, the seven sacred direction. You're going to look after our words that we agreed to with each other. And those words cannot be broken by anybody unless we invite everybody back here and bring out the pipes again and invite those spirits that are holding our words to sit down and unwrap those words. And then we will talk around in a circle until we speak with one voice again. And then we continuously... Uh, participate in this ceremony to, to deposit our words to the seven sacred directions. And that's the meaning, <coughs> excuse me, that's the meaning of, of the pipe ceremony. And in, in the end of the wampum belt, you'll see a pipe and a, and a hatchet. The hatchet was brought out to say, okay, the person that came and disrupted my way of life, well, I'm going to ask him, bury your hatchet first and then I'm going to put mine on top. So the meaning of that is 
you're, you, we're burying our conflicts. But you, since you were the aggressor, you bury yours first. And, and so in, in the time of future conflict, if you pick up your ax, it exposes our ax that are sitting on the top. And it gives us the means to protect ourselves. So we have the hatchet. And then we have that dance we have that's been celebrated at the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, the Nesquat. Nesquan is to deflect a, a blow coming towards you. And when they're dancing, they're dancing like this, all around in a circle, the Nesquat. And American anthropologists uh, labeled that wrong and called it the war dance. And, and I, in most indigenous societies, I find it, they are not always the aggressors. Like I said earlier, it's, it's families that are conflicting with each other. And so these are like small family squabbles. They're not a whole nation picking up and going after another nation because we don't have any evidence of, of, of uh, what do you call a big pyramids of skulls, human skulls, that would result from one nation. And the reason for that is there was no aggression because our food supplies, we never stockpiled anything. The animals are out there. That's what we told the Europeans when they arrived. The animals are out there. The birds are out there. The fish is out there. The plants are out there. We'll just show you how to, how to make food and medicine and tools and everything you need to survive out of them. So we didn't stockpile all that stuff. So there was no reason for indigenous nations to, to aggress one another. There was no typical sign of this kind of aggression along the eastern seaboard. I cannot speak for some of the other nations in, in Central America or in Central United States, uh, but I think that that is a result of the introduction of the horse and, and the metal, or the axe or the sword that the Vikings brought about a thousand years ago. This is what we started fighting about and fighting over. So back to the treaties. Uh, and, and talking about reconciliation, I mean, I, I'm just moving it forward a little bit. With the treaties, the negotiation process were done. The uh, peace pipe was brought out, the sacred pipe, the smudging, the sweat lodge ceremony, everybody cleansed themselves and, and they're negotiating now. And then the other thing that they did around those two pillars of rock was every Indian kind of locked hands with a British or a, an English soldier or member. And they made a big circle around these two pillars of stone. And this is what, the, what they call the covenant chain the covenant chain of people, hu human beings, joining together with locked arms. And in the Mi'kmaq, the word for treaty is debludaan. Deb, deb is to get inside of, debasin. Uh, Alludaan is a fence, to be inside the fence. And this human fence, the covenant chain around these two brothers, has a very strong symbolic representation in, in an oral historical context to indigenous peoples in North America. It's not the words that are written down because we know those words have changed and shifted and somebody else's interpretation and meanings are imported on those. But it's the nature of the ceremony and the act. What we did deliberately without thinking without sitting back and externalizing our philosophies and so on and so forth, we just made a deliberate act of a joint people, the Wabanaki Alliance, as a defense for our protection. So I was naming off those treaties in the 1600s, but every time a treaty was broken, it's because a European wanted to settle somewhere up the river where it had been agreed they're not going to go beyond those, those little, that little wharf and the little fence around their, their habitation and to keep the savage people out. Well, 
this, this fence kind of ex kept extending further, and each time the treaty was broken, the indigenous people were pointed at, why did you break the treaty? Well, we were just protecting ourselves. Uh, why is he over here when he's supposed to be inside the fence? Okay, well, we broke, we broke the treaty. Uh, uh, you guys sign here. And in, in all those treaties, it would always say that the indigenous people killed and scalped and raped and burned European peoples. So therefore, the treaty was broken, and a new one was signed. So that boundary was always, all of a sudden, extended. And, and then uh, several years later, another person decides to go and speculate on land up further up the river, and so on and so forth. So these treaties ended up uh, becoming broken and, and, and renegotiated once more. How am I for time? Fifteen more minutes, whoa. <laughs> so the treaty relationship is an ancient, uh, it's an ancient act, it's an ancient relationship among indigenous groups in First Nations, Aboriginal groups, and, and, and when the European peoples arrived, we entered into those kind of relationships with them as well. When the French arrived, we gave them women, the French, from 1606 to 1632, there were no women, no French women in North America until uh, de Razilli arrived with, with a boatload of uh, French families. But during that period of time, the Mi'kmaq people and the Wulastukwiuk people gave their young daughters to the French. And the way the French were able to access the territories and lands of indigenous peoples was, if I wanted to marry a chief's daughter, I'd have to prove to him I'm a good hunter and I could supply him and his family. If anything were to happen to him, I could supply, I'm a good hunter, and I could supply and support his family, his wife and grandmother, whatever, whoever was there, that I'm a good hunter and I'm a good man for his wife. So I would be able to show to him and prove to him. But these French people, when they arrived, they married a, an indigenous daughter, the daughter of a chief, and they said, well, we want to go up the river here. And they go up the river with the daughter. But this time, the French had European goods to give to the chief. I can supply you with all that stuff. Beads, you name it, cloth, some foodstuffs. And, and so it was easy for the French to develop their territoriality in Mi'kmaq and Wulustukwiuk territory they started to establish these seigneuries, they called them in French. It was a, a grant of land from the King of France here in, in New France or Acadia at the time. And then the treaty relationship started to enter into the, into the scene. Um, for all of us, I mean, uh, the, uh, the treaties were something that, that were like solemn agreements between one nation to the, to the other. And the point I'm trying to um, drive here is there are ways that these oral traditions were, were kept alive. Now, after the treaty relationships in, in, in Casco Bay in New England, then we, we arrive, and some of the sources of that information that I have is, is written by uh, Samuel Penhollow, the uh, history of Indian wars in Eastern Canada, in Eastern North America, uh, United States really at the time when he wrote out of Boston and he was a son of a, <laughs> his father was a justice of the peace and, he, and, and his father witnessed the signing of a lot of those treaties in, in the in Casco Bay area in Boston and around that area. <clears throat> but Samuel Penhollow 
wrote a book and he highlighted those treaty relationships and, and the reasons why those aggressions took place. And he took a, a very conservative, no, very liberal um, <clears throat> position uh, from an English context saying, we did wrong to these people. We took their land, we stole their land, and we, and we uh, appropriated in our documents things that really didn't, uh, we shouldn't have. So uh, the importance of, of, of those oral uh, relationships and recordings, I mean, we move forward to the treaties of the 1700s. 17, <clears throat> there was a treaty in 1712, 1718, 1720, 1722, and the most notable one that was entered into in Boston was 1725, and that one was ratified. It was brought up to Annapolis Royal, or it used to be Port Royal at some point, <clears throat> uh, where, where the seat of the French government had been from the 1600s. And all of a sudden, when, when the English uh, beat the French at war, uh, there was a Treaty of Utrecht signed in 1713 between the French and the English over our territory in, in North America. So the English took over the territory in 1712, 1713. I mean, they took it over earlier, but a treaty was made in 1713. It's called the Treaty of Utrecht. And thereby given that the territory in Nova Scotia, with the exception of uh, Ile Royale, Cape Britain. Uh, Cape Britain was left to the French while the rest of Nova Scotia or Acadia was belonged to the British. They arrived here, they established themselves at Port Royal and they, they changed the name to Annapolis Royal, named after Queen Anne, who was the Queen of England at the time, Annapolis, the city of Anne. Uh, but they kept the name Royal because it was uh, indicative of the, where the location was, Port Royal. So they, they brought the treaties up, up, up there and the English established themselves and, and uh, they entered into these treaty relationships. 1725 treaty and then uh, 1726 a ratification at Port Royal. And then there was a treaty in 1749 at the mouth of the St. John River with the Willistook, Wiyuk, and Mi'kmaq people uh, at the near St. John in, in 1749. And then 1752, there was a treaty of peace and friendship that was signed at, at Shubenacadie. And five minutes. <laughs> I, I could have lectured here all day. <coughs> uh, so the treaties of uh, 1752, uh, it was a treaty that was used by the Mi'kmaq Grand Chief, Ben Silliboy, in uh, Cape Britain in a case dealing with Aboriginal hunting and uh, rights. And he lost and he was, uh, it, this was in 1929. There was another uh, case that's never really mentioned. Uh, it was a chief from Eel Ground, uh, a guy by the name of Daniel Paul. And he happened to be trapping in Moncton, and he got caught. And he, he, this was in 1922, and the trial happened in 1925. And he also relied on the Treaty of 1760, uh, entered into in Halifax. But he lost the case as well. And it wasn't until the 1950s, 51, 57, 59, uh, Andrew Francis from Big Cove was a chief. He took a group of men and into a neighboring field or forest and they were cutting logs and they got charged for trespassing. Uh, he used the treaties as a right. He lost. He couldn't prove his uh, connection to the treaties, that he was related to the people that signed the treaties. 17, uh, 1956, 57 was the Simon case, the Willie John Simon case, and Francis, Douglas Francis. They were fishing salmon and they knocked a fisheries officer uh, into the water because he was trying to take their salmon net. And they went to trial. They lost because they couldn't connect uh, with the, the Mi'kmaq that signed the treaties. Um, and then there was uh, there were other treaties that were uh, court cases that were entered into. And then finally, uh, 
we get into the 1970s. Uh, Matthew Simon at Shibunakari uh, was out hunting, or he, he was planning to go hunting. He had a gun in his pickup truck, and he got, he got stopped, and he was charged for uh, hunting and possession of a rifle in, uh, out of season. And he used the Treaty of 1752 as a protection. And that case went all the way up to the Supreme Court by 1985, and there was a, a, a ruling that uh, the, the Treaty of 1752 that he used as a defense uh, was, uh, was OK, that he could rely on that. But, but that was an individual Mi'kmaq person, and anybody else that's going to do the same thing is going to have to argue and bring it up to the Supreme Court level as well. There was no granting of a collective right after the Supreme Court made their decision. And it wasn't until after the, <clears throat> it wasn't until after the, and you know, I'm jealous of those things anyway, so <laughs> it's all right. Um, it wasn't until after the, those, those other treaties, uh, court cases were, were fought, the uh, Donald Marshall case, a Neil Fishing case, uh, and then uh, after the Marshall case, uh, John Reed and I and Bill Wicken were involved as expert witnesses in, uh, in the Josh Bernard case and in uh, another case in Nova Scotia, it was called the Stephen Marshall case, Stephen Frederick Marshall, which combined 52 other Mi'kmaq people trying to access logs in, on Crown lands in Nova Scotia. And then I got involved in several, the Von, Von Perley, Von Paul case, Maliseet case, or Willistook Wiuk case here um, in the St. John River, and then some Francis cases in Big Cove, and uh, Josh Bernard case in the Miramichi, and then the Jackie Vautour Metis case in, in uh, the Rishabakto area and up to Moncton. But the other idea, the other concept of the things that I provided to the courts as an expert witness was the oral history knowledge that I have about the treaties. And what I wanted to mention, the continuation of the covenant chain and that link, continuation of those treaties from as early as possibly 1658 all the way up to the last one that was signed in the Miramichi in 1779 and the one in the St. John River Valley that was signed uh, near the mouth of the St. John River uh, on Rusagonish, I think it was the name of the community where uh, Michael Franklin, who was the superintendent of Indian Affairs for Nova Scotia, brought Mi'kmaq and Willistukwiuk people there and they signed a treaty. I think it was in the latter end of the American Revolution on the St. John River so that the Willistukwiuk people and the Mi'kmaq people would not uh, joined the Americans in the in the revolution process. Uh, at the Mi'kmaq Grand Council in 1929, uh, Clara Dennis, who was a daughter of, a, of the owner of the Halifax Chronicle, she uh, was traveling around. She got a degree in English in Nova Scotia, and her father gave her a 1927 Model T4 to to travel. And she published books and because of her journals. She visited all different uh, communities in Nova Scotia. She just opened history books and history documents and, and went to see the people, descendants of those historical people uh, that represented uh, historical events. But she was in Cape Britain, and she ran into uh, this Gabrielle Silliboy in Peter, St. Peter's, selling baskets and axe handles and asking him, what are you doing here? What are you? She, he said, I'm a grand chief. I'm responsible for looking after my people. I'm here selling baskets and axe handles so I can have enough food to feed my all my people that are coming here to Chapel Island to celebrate uh, the, the Feast of St. Anne as well as uh, the gathering of the Grand Council. Come and join us. So when she went to visit, she observed the Grand Chief bringing out the, the pipe, doing the pipe ceremony, and, and then the Buddhas, or the wampum belt keeper, the wampum belt keeper. Uh, his last name was Alec, and, and uh, Buddhus, Captain Alec, and he was the keeper of the wampum belt. He, when the ceremony was done, he went and buried a, an axe at the corner of the church, 
and symbolically buried the hatchet. And, and that was the, the, the actions that the Mi'kmaq Grand Council were, were still following along, going back since 1658. The actual ceremony, the lighting of the pipe, and the reading of the wampum belt, and then the burying of the, the hatchet. And uh, interestingly enough, when the treaty of 1761 was signed by Ulustukwiuk, Passamaquoddy people and Mi'kmaq people in Halifax, Governor Belcher took the whole group of people to his farm and then he celebrated by establishing do these two pillars of stone and the people, the, the Mi'kmaq Grand Council members and, and uh, the British soldiers locking their arms and <coughs> joining in this covenant circle, the Debludan process, was, was reenacted. So the oral history, supported by Jonathan Belcher, whose father was also a judge and, and witnessed uh, some of these events in, in Boston. So some of this oral history is supported by written evidence, but the traditions that we learn from our ancestors, our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers, I mean my great-grandfather Duma Augustine, his great-grandfather was Michael Augustine, who signed a treaty in Halifax on March 10, 1760. And uh, so this is the reason why they call me hereditary chief. It's my descendancy comes from that line of Augustine hereditary chiefs. And the reconciliation and the treaties of peace and friendship that I'm talking about is after the enactment of the Indian Act in 1876, there was a section in the, in, in, in the, uh, uh, one more minute, okay. <laughs> well, okay, I'm not gonna rely on that because I'm jealous of it anyway. There was a section, section 62 of the Indian Act in 1876 that said something like this, that all life chiefs after they die will discontinue their role as life chiefs. That means all traditional hereditary Wulustukwiuk and Mi'kmaq chiefs, members of the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, would no longer be recognized by the government of Canada. Instead, they enacted uh, a section that says, well, there's reserves, there's land reserved for Indians, and there's Indians going to be living on those lands, and there is a democratic system of governance that's going to be established on those reserves. They're going to elect their leaders and council members. And so that section indicated that by federal statute law, they established the elected <coughs> Indian chiefs and council. So the federal statute law is part of the federal government system. And by virtue of that Indian Act and, and that section, it separated our people. We're still related. I'm not against any elected chief or council. I have relatives on the council. My nephew's a chief in Big Cove or Elsie Bukto. And, and it's not, it's just that the, all the division that has been imparted on our people, we're fighting one another over the almighty dollar. And we're fighting over our roles as hereditary chiefs and elected chiefs. But what I'm saying is reconciliation the federal government of Canada should recognize the role of the hereditary system of governance among our people. That should be something that the federal government should say, okay, it's you guys. There was no Indian Act in 17, 1725, 1726, 1749, 1760. There was no Indian Act chiefs. There were just Ulustukwiuk chiefs and Mi'kmaq chiefs members of the Mi'kmaq Grand Council. We were part of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And we were all allied people. And somehow our authority, our responsibility had just been taken away just like that. And people like myself now have all this knowledge and information about our history, our culture, our traditions, our ceremonies, my language, uh, are left outside. The government, with the federal statute law, is, 
Indian Act chiefs, and they're sitting there negotiating Aboriginal and treaty rights. And if you look at the Indian Act today, what does it say about rights outside of those reserves? It's the hereditary system of governance that are responsible for the Aboriginal and treaty rights of our peoples. It's not identified in a legal context. That role, any transference of that responsibility from the hereditary systems or the traditional systems to the elected systems. We didn't give up our sovereignty to the crown. We didn't give up our sovereignty to the, to the British. We still have our sovereignty. And, and like the government of Canada said to us, the Eastern peoples, Canada's sovereignty is not absolute because we en because <laughs> we entered into treaties of peace and friendship, not treaties of surrender. We never surrendered our sovereignty and we sur never surrendered our lands. The government appropriated this, this, this role and, and we have never, there has been no reconciliation and I, I, and, and I leave you with that because I, 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 I ask our leaders, our traditional leaders and our elected leaders to come together and let's, let's talk as an Aboriginal First Nation and, and let us sit down and negotiate because the negotiation processes right now with all those treaty tables or negotiation tables in the five provinces the chief's cards are down and exposed. While the Grand Council members and the Willistukwiuk uh, traditional system, they don't receive any money from the federal government, so our cards are close to us. So we have a negotiating kind of element, and our knowledge systems are, are the foundation of those negotiation processes. Thank you very much. Thank you.